and welcome to TechFunnel.com's interview series for Women's History Month. My name is Danny White, and today we have joining us Tina Wells. Tina Wells is the CEO and founder of Buzz Marketing Group, an agency that serves clients like Dell, Microsoft, Sony Music, American Eagle Outfitters, and Levo. She authored the youth marketing handbook, Chasing Youth Culture and Getting It Right, as well as the best-selling tween series, Mackenzie Blue. Welcome, Tina. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Danny. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, awesome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. Sure. So, um, I started the agency almost 23 years ago when I was 16. Um, I, I definitely call myself an accidental entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a fashion editor. And um, at, at 15, I landed a job writing for a newspaper for girls uh, as a product review editor. And when I would say and send my reviews to companies, they would always ask me the same question. If I send you more product, will you tell me what you think? And so mm -hmm. uh, as a teenager, I thought I had like the, the dream job. And, you know, very early on, a quote unquote client told me I could make money as a market researcher. And so I didn't quite know what that meant. I happened to be a freshman in college at this time and was very fortunate to work with a professor to figure out a business plan and a model that, that we pretty much still use today. And so... Uh, you know, I definitely, as a teenager, did not know I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I knew I had a passion for product and for really consumer products, and that's still what I do today. Awesome. So at 16, you started your company. How did you have such an entrepreneurial spirit at a young age? You said you didn't know you were going to be an entrepreneur, but how did you like steer yourself in that direction? Well, so I'm the oldest of six kids, and we were definitely raised in a pretty entrepreneurial family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, my mom has 13 siblings, and, you know, all eight of my uncles were, you know, had their own businesses at some point. And so I definitely came from an entrepreneurial family and had a lot of those early influences. And so uh, my parents really supported us in, in all of our endeavors, and you know, my youngest brother, the super talented music producer and mm -hmm. you know, start pursuing that when he was really young. And so I think we just were raised in an environment where we could pursue the things we were passionate about and, and we were really encouraged to do so. That's awesome. Well, how did you come up with the name Buzz Marketing? And was it, has it always been the name of the company or did you like go through some name and branding changes along the way? Yeah, it's always been, I mean, we definitely have um, gone through like some iterations of the name and early on it was Buzz Teen. And then transition to Buzz Marketing Group. And then a couple of years ago, we did a rebrand to Buzz MG. And so um, I always knew that Buzz was going to be really important. Um, and I'm a big daydreamer. So I guess my, <laughs> my best daydreams when I'm either like meditating or in church and doing. So I, I was one of those kids, you know, who was always like on the car ride thinking about things. And so it was definitely a scenario like that where I got the name. And then, you know, I, I, naming things is one of the things I think I'm pretty good at. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of one of those moments of inspiration, but it's definitely uh, been something we've stuck with for a really long time. Very nice. So can you talk to us a little bit about Elevation Tribe, which is a platform that focuses on women of color who actually want to grow and lead companies of their own? Yeah, so Elevation Tribe came to me a couple of years ago. I'd say, well, I'm two years ago when I read an article called The Black Ceiling and it was really talking about um, how Black women were having a hard time ascending to the C-suite and, and becoming CEOs of, of companies. And so I really thought about my own trajectory and what allowed me to be successful. And then, um, you know, what, I, what it came down to is I had this really awesome tribe of women who were super supportive. And, and even if we had to hop on the phone with each other at 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. we'd take the call or give the, the advice to help our friends. But, you know, we all were in the same boat of either like raising kids or being super involved in family and not being able to kind of formally mentor. And so mm -hmm. my dream for Elevation Tribe was that it would become that network of mentors that maybe didn't have time for one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, it really for me was about giving people the advice that I give my friends and that my friends give me. Mm -hmm. And that's what we produced in the first work journal, which is really kind of like a magazine, but much more interactive. And so you now we're working on the next issue. And really, I think this year, you know, we wanted to get the first work journal out. So here's what it is. Now let's really focus on the best way 
to help women. And so, you know, the goal of the company and the mission of the company is to help women launch, grow, and lead companies. And mm-hmm. we are focused on women of color. And so, you know, I would say probably 40% of our, of, of you know, our members want to launch, 40% want to grow what they have, and 20% want to lead within organizations. So it is quite an entrepreneurial venture, but we really want to support women at every stage in, in their career. Very nice. Very interesting concept um, that you've created there with Elevation Tribe. So switching gears now just a little bit, how do you think marketing has evolved over the past couple of years? And like, where do you see it going in the next five to 10 years? I feel like marketing in in my entire career, I feel like the last five years have had, you know, I've seen the most growth or, you know, change. And what I mean by that is, you know, think about the amount of media channels that matter over the last five years, you know, Mm -hmm. I remember when we had things like appointment TV and now you have hundreds, if not thousands of options and ways to to receive content. You can stream it, you know, or one of my favorites, I love listening to podcasts. And so the amount of content means that it's harder for marketers to kind of pin down our market, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's no longer, we know if we watch the show or or advertising a show that has 30 million viewers, it's a slam dunk. Like that, that those don't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's changed. I think the, the idea of influencer, although I think I built my entire career on the idea that we make most of our purchasing decisions based on what a friend recommends. I think the definition of a friend has changed a lot. So mm-hmm. influencers are just kind of modern friends that we chat with. And so I think right. when you add in it, marketing has become a lot more complex than it was mm-hmm. when I started. Early on, it was, you know, here's the formula. If you can afford this formula, you're pretty, you, you're, you know, your plan is going to be pretty successful. But what I do find really interesting is that, you know, it isn't just a pay to play anymore. If you're really innovative and scrappy and have a cool idea, you can get into a market that you may not have been able to get into five years ago, really innovate, you know, grow a company and create, you know, billion dollar unicorn companies. And we're mm-hmm. seeing that, whether it's like, you know, the Glossier news that we saw, I mean, it's a really really impactful and, and really important, um, you know, event that's happened because here's a woman who started out as a blogger who, you know, raised and grew to billion dollar beauty company. If you think mm-hmm. about traditional beauty, that's so stagnated because they're stuck in the Macy's of the world. Absolutely. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of, you know, excitement and, and activity. And so, you know, I think it's, it's never been easier to start a company mm-hmm. and it's never been more democratized. You know, I remember starting out and, you know, uh, my initial website, costing so much money and just the whole idea of having a customer I think we called CMS system or whatever like mm-hmm. management system and now it's like you've got WordPress you can have a website beautifully designed for $60 template you know and so I think the democratization you know these tools has been really great and that and that's what I've seen change the most over the last five years. So you've obviously you obviously started your company when you were very young what are some suggestions that you would give to other companies or other entrepreneurs who want to market to a millennial audience? Young people, I mean, under 35 who are on their phones, on their, addicted to their, their digital devices, and who shop online, read online, who watch videos online. How do you market to that audience? You could seriously have just de- described, you know, a 55 year old today, <laughs> you know, even just with that. And so uh, my point is, I think psychographics matter more than demographics. And I think mm-hmm. that we as marketers, marketers have to continue to shift to being very focused on the psychographics. Um, mm-hmm. For example, if you're coastal, I would argue that, you know, coastal Gen Xers and boomers may have different buying behaviors and, and different uh, content consumption behaviors than, you know, maybe a boomer or Gen X or who's in the Midwest or the Southeast or Southwest, you know? And so I think it's less, I think the, the, the lines are blurring. And I would say, you know, if you are a tween who's the eldest in your family, you might be behaving differently than a tween who's the youngest in the family. Right. And so, you know, there, there, there's so many different things that I think are at play that I really personally look at psychographic data when I'm really trying to figure out, a trend or how to be really impactful. And so I think, you know, you've got to have a, a way of distilling all of this data that is coming at all of us every day um, and be really focused on what you offer your, your customer and making sure there's the right product market fit. That's kind of what I preach to everyone is get to product market fit, you'll find mm-hmm. your audience, and then you've got to just, you know, 
scale that as quickly as possible. Awesome. So you mentioned earlier about how democratized um, just marketing and website building and IT in general is. Um, starting a business is rather tough for almost anybody. What has what helped you get through some of those early stage challenges um, in starting your own company? I definitely think being young. You know, I, I often say if I had started 10 years older or if I had started today, I would quit. You know, I think mm-hmm. you know, ignorance is bliss. And that's yeah. the benefit of being young. You know, I had big bumps and hiccups. I was still living at home with mom and dad and learning the business in college. And so, you know, I, I think the older I get, the tougher it is to take a hit because, you know, I just, you get accustomed to a certain way of life or, mm-hmm. or a little bit of predictability. And when you're younger and scrappy, you know, the first 10 years, you know, I would say I'm 26 by the time I was 10 years into the company. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I was definitely, you know, still pretty young and 26 and still young to start a company. And by the time I was 27, I was doing a five book deal with Harper Collins and, and, and getting into publishing. And so, you know, I was really fortunate to start young. And I, you know, I, I run a program. I'm the academic director of a program at Wharton called Leadership in the Business World, where I work primarily with 17 and 18 year olds mm-hmm. who come and spend the month at Penn and, and they start companies. And I think that's so great because I say to them, you know, my intention is to teach you how to start any company you want to start. Mm-hmm. And it's great if you fail because now you just learn more. And so, you know, I really emphasize starting as young as possible just to get those bumps out of the way. And then you can afford to not make a lot of money. You know, I, I could afford to work for free for the first two years because I didn't have student loan debt or any of those things. You know, mm-hmm. I was just literally living at home with my parents, using their phone line, using their internet. <laughs> when I got to college, you know, very, you know, being very specific here, you know, mm-hmm. getting free advice from, from my professors. I often joke that like, I personally find my college education to be the best investment I made because Mm -hmm. of the consulting and and the business help I got that would have cost me so much money, you know, had had I tried to hire those professors to help me. And so I emphasize starting as young as possible. And it doesn't mean that, you know, if you've had a really successful career, you're too old. Absolutely not. You know, I have a friend and actually the woman who was on the cover of our magazine has a very successful corporate career and started her dream you know, company on the side when her friends told her that she made the best applesauce they'd ever had. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it definitely doesn't disqualify that, but I think you choose a path. And then, you know, I, I think it's hard to be kind of in the middle of a career and decide that you're going to switch gears and become an entrepreneur. I find that to be yeah. a really tricky transition. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So how do you define success personally for yourself? I think for me, it's really having the ability to make whatever decision I need to make at that moment and, and, and being fully in control of that choice. I don't like having <laughs> decisions that have to be made for me because, you know, I'm locked into certain scenarios. So for me, that just means I choose the clients we work with and I never have to take a client that I'm not passionate about or, or whose product I don't believe in. And that, you know, above all, I think that is how I define success. And, you know, I, I have the same friends I've had since childhood. Um, and, and that's also for me defining success that yes, I, I've met some really lovely and amazing people along the way. And I, you know, bring them into the fold, but I, I feel like I haven't, you know, really lost who I was as a, as a kid. And, and it's really important for me to be very connected to my family and to my friends. You've written several books and published them. Um, what book have you read that has changed your life the most or that has inspired you the most? Oh, geez. Um, I, that's a hard question to answer. And I will tell you why. Um, I read a book a week. And so oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've always been this way since I was a kid. I remember living for summers because I could then read what I wanted to read and not what I had <laughs> not to read. And that's really and yeah. yeah. It was like nothing in Richard. I mean, it was like Fear Street every day, mm-hmm. you know, Sweet Valley Twins, Sweet Valley High. But I just consumed, um, Pretty, pretty voraciously. And I would say um, the book that's been most impactful, um, probably Home Homegoing. Do you know that book by Yah? Uh, by Yah Yassi? No, I haven't read that one. Yeah. Tell, um, us, tell us a little bit about it. Give us a little sneak peek. It's a beautiful book. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing book. And it really, um, really charts the history of two families um, mm-hmm. from Ghana 
uh, pre, you know, before the slave trade through, I want to say the 1980s in the U S. And so, um, it's just really incredible. It's incredible characters and stories. And it was something that really helped me kind of connect and understand, you know, my family's evolution and it's a beautifully written book, but, um, just really impactful as well. I feel like it's one of those things that should be required reading for everyone. For everyone. Awesome. I'll have to get my hands on that one. Um, so what are some things that you love to do and how do you make time for doing those things? Obviously being a businesswoman and having, running your own company, how do you make time to do, to do the things that you love to do? Um, I would say that my, my life is built around me being able to do what I love to do. I mean, this, I, I say that, but I, you know, in all honesty, this time of year is really tough to make that happen because we have clients who are, you know, really launching projects. And I was just telling a friend, I'm going to be, you know, running until the holidays. And then they're like, you need Memorial Day. I'm like, no, I mean, I'm going to get a break for Christmas. Like, come Thanksgiving, <laughs> things will calm down. And that's calm it. Down, yeah. um, but I, I, I made tough decisions. You know, I, I, my family is really important to me. I have one niece and we spend a lot of time together and we, I just finished planning our spring break trip in a couple of weeks. And, you know, it's a conflict already because I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be in LA. I haven't been in LA in months mm-hmm. and I'm starting to commit to, to, to things. And so I'm like, okay, how it's on my mind. How am I going to make this work where mm-hmm. we get our one-on-one time, but I still have to, Speak up for breakfast or dinner, and you know, it, it maybe that I incorporate, or you know, my niece and my sister into my plans. And but it, it's something I'm constantly thinking about. But I, you know, I've gotten good at the carve outs. I think there mm-hmm. is a piece of your career where you don't have the choice. I want to be very um, honest about that. Right, I'm absolutely. 23 years and you know into a career now, but the first 10 I didn't have a choice. I, mm-hmm. I didn't even go on vacation. And I remember my older cousin is one of my best friends forcing me to go to Miami on a girl's trip and mm-hmm. telling me my laptop wasn't invited and I could barely take at the time my Blackberry. Um, so it hasn't always been like this, but now I'm, I'm very intentional about that time because I know how important it is for me to have the big ideas and be strategic for our clients. And so mm-hmm. that means I have to also know when to take a break so I can recharge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And indeed that's been one of the, for me personally, one of the biggest lessons that I've had to learn along the way. So definitely you have to do work hard, but you also have to rest hard as well. So um, what would you tell other women who are currently aiming to start their own companies? They have this great idea. They might even have like mentors. They may have funders already. How do you encourage them to take that leap of faith that let them know that they can do it? Yeah, I think, we all, even if we know what we think we know, we all get stuck at some point, you know? And I think what I would say is what's been my saving grace is I focus on one thing and I try to know more about that area than anyone else and to constantly innovate in that area. And so, you know, I started in youth marketing. They, they grew up and became millennials. And, you know, obviously multicultural has always been something we've been focused on in some way, but we don't really diversify. And so, you know, I... I'm, I'm not about, you know, being kind of a jack of all trades. It's like, no, this is just, you know, this is what I focus on. This is what I know. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stay in my lane. And I think it's really important to kind of own a lane mm-hmm. and not be all over the place thinking that, well, there's money over here. So I'm going to do this. And I think it's really important to be focused and within that area of focus to know as much as possible about what you're doing and to really know more than anybody else. Awesome. What is the best advice that you've ever received? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, you know, I don't think that there's a best piece of advice. I, I would say um, every season you need different advice. And so I think the best advice um, I've ever been given is is that when things are tough, don't tell everyone about it. Be really, um, you know, be authentic with everyone and transparent with a few people. And so I found that, you know, when I need advice, there are just a handful of people I go to, people first of all, whose lives look like what I want mine to look like and Mm -hmm. who I admire. Um, You know, you don't really need advice from everyone. People Mm -hmm. seem to always want to tell you what they do. And you have to realize that comes colored through their glasses of their life and their life experience. What could be very different from from yours. And so, you know, for me, it's like when I go and get advice about business from someone, 
as much as I respect them who didn't start a company as a teenager and have it and hasn't invested most of their life in this business, you know, that you have to really think about why you're asking people for advice and, and understand people want to be helpful, but they can only give you their experience and that may not always be what you're, what you're looking for. Absolutely. Awesome advice. Tina, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your story and your journey. It's been incredible listening to you. Um, we wish you and your company all the best. Um, guys, thank you for listening to this interview. For these and other interviews and topics, please visit techfunnel.com. You can connect with us across social, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter so you can stay up to date on what is happening in the industry. 